We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? Good morning. It's really good to see you all in the chapel service this morning. Let's open the Bible, Genesis chapter 21, verse 31, to chapter 22, the verse 2. Genesis chapter 21, verse 31, chapter 22, verse 2. Therefore, he called the place Beersheba, because there the two of them took an oath. So they made a covenant at Beersheba, and Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, arose and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the land of the Philistines for many days. Now it came about after these things. God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. When I was in elementary school, if I say the faith in Sunday school, my teacher always mentioned the event in Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham offered Isaac. As we already know, God commanded that Abraham to offer his only son, Isaac, as a burnt offering. And Abraham immediately obeyed him. As Abraham built an altar for burnt offering and was about to sacrifice, God sent an angel to tell him, do not lay your hand on that boy. And Abraham sacrificed a ram God prepared. Whenever I read this passage, I always wondered, no matter how great his faith how could Abraham even attempt to sacrifice his son, the one who loved so much? That's great and amazing, but I don't understand. After I had my youngest boy 10 years ago, I do not understand this passage even more. When I got back home from work, he ran to me like a puppy and then jump into the, my arms, and then the stress of the day just flies away. If God commands me to sacrifice my curly little boy, as he did to Abraham, I don't think I'm able to do that. So what do you think if God commands you to sacrifice your kid? Can you do that? The writer of the book of Hebrews tells us how Abraham was able to do this in book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. Verse 19. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. The writer of the book of Hebrews interprets 
It is because Abraham the possessed resurrection faith. That means Isaac would be alive again from death. His interpretation seems to make sense because in Genesis chapter 21, just before the offering of Isaac, Abraham had called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God at Beersheba. Here the word resurrection and everlasting are closely related. That Abraham had the resurrection faith is unbelievable. The Old Testament mentions the resurrection, but only in a few verses. And an ancient Near Eastern document show a similar, but not exactly the same concept to resurrection. That is, in agricultural background, the change of season, the frozen dead ground of winter coming alive with hot wind as spring, was religiously symbolized as a resurrection of the weather gods. As Christians you know, who know and believe in Jesus Christ's resurrection, it may be easy for us to take this as a given. But in reality, we believe resurrection as a future event that will happen at the second coming of the Jesus Christ or as an event that spiritually happens in our lives. But do you really believe that real and physical resurrection is happening in our current lives? No, that is very difficult to believe. It is a, such a mystery that for Abraham to possess resurrection faith in his days about 3,800 years ago. So in order to understand how Abraham came to possess resurrection faith, we needed to see what happened to Abraham before Genesis chapter 22. Because in Hebrew, the first verse of Genesis chapter 22 verse 1 says, after these things. This implies Abraham came to have a faith in resurrection through a series of events occurring just before Genesis chapter 22. The series of events takes place over two chapters, Genesis chapter 20 and then 21. And then these events are also deeply related to the God's covenant with Abraham and Genesis chapter 12. If you look at Genesis chapter 12, God promised Abraham he will make a great nation for him. In order to make a great nation, two things are absolutely required. First, there must be a descendant to form the nation. And then second, there must be the land for the descendant to live in. In Genesis chapter 20 and then 21, there are two events related to the descendants and then two other events related to the land. So now let's look at the first two events related to the offspring. The first event can be found in Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2. Now Abraham journeyed from there toward the land of the Negev, and then settled between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerah. Abraham said of the Sarah his wife, she is my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gerah, sent and then took Sarah. When Abraham and Sarah went down to the land of the Gerah, Sarah, his wife, was so, so beautiful woman. So Abraham feared the land of people would kill him and then take her away. So he lied. Sarah was his sister. It is true that Sarah was Abraham's half-sister. But it is also true 
he has bad intention to lie for begging for his life because he did not reveal she was actually his wife. This is already the second time for Abraham to lie out of fear. He did that in Egypt in Genesis chapter 12, and then he did that now in the land of Gerah. He is so lame, isn't he? Why did Abraham lie twice his wife Sarah was his sister? We can find the reason, Genesis chapter 20, verse 11. He said, there is no fear of God in that land. In other words, to the eyes of Abraham, the people in that place didn't have any fear of God. It reflects Abraham's mind and heart. He was so afraid of his future and his death. In reality, Abraham perceived this place as a place where God's power may not reach. For Abraham, God was not an omnipotent God, but a God with limited power, as if he was powerful only in certain areas. If we were a country like Afghanistan or North Korea, you may feel like Abraham. Anyway, Abimelech, the king of Gera, saw Sarah was so beautiful and then took her to his palace. But that night, God appeared in Abimelech's dream and then told him, if he did not send her back to Abraham right away, God would kill him and then destroy his whole household. Abimelech was so afraid and devastated, so quickly sent the Sarah back to Abraham and then gave Abraham sheep, oxen, and a servant, and also 1,000 pieces of silver. If you look at the Bible much later, Joseph was sold only for 20 pieces of silver. So 1,000 pieces of silver was a great amount of money. And in addition, he let Abraham live in his land. So Abraham prayed to God in gratitude for Abimelech's generosity. And God favored Abimelech so that he healed him and his wife and his maid servant so that they bore children. Second event related to the offspring is found in Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord took note of the Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. Finally, Sarah gave birth to Isaac. After in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham prayed and wanted so long for his son. After 25 years of waiting, finally he received his son. The book of Hebrew described like this. Isaac was born of one man as good as that. Here, one man as good as that refers to Abraham. Moreover, Genesis chapter 11.30 tells us Sarah was barren from her youth and then has not conceived any child. Abraham, who was too old, as good as dead. And then Sarah, who was barren from her youth and had not conceived any child, met each other and then had a baby. This is a miracle that cannot be explained without by God's intervention. 
Through these two events related to the offspring, Abraham came to realize God is omnipotent and unfaithful. Through a dream, God protected Abraham's wife Sarah to conceive the Isaac, the promised offspring. And through the opening of the womb of Abimelech's wife and his maid servant, Abraham realized the ability to conceive a baby is in God's hand. And finally, Abraham came to believe in almighty and promise-keeping God who gave Isaac from his body as good as dead. This realization got evolved into the resurrection phase. If God can give a new life through a dead body, he can raise this child from the dead. And then now, let's look at two events to the related to the land. Today is a setting, this southern part of Israel, near the desert of Negev, has an arid and a an dry climate. So, Abraham was a nomad. So, the wells with plenty of the fresh water and the pasture were an absolute necessity for his livestock. In Australia, it takes 6,000 acres of pasture to raise one cow a year. So, Abraham must need a lot of pasture. But pasture needs water to grow the grass. So wells of plenty of water were the biter in his days. In first instance, is about the well of Hagar and Ishmael. In Genesis chapter 21, verses 13 to 19, God opened the eyes of the Hagar who was dying of thirst so that she could find a well. This led to life for Hagar and Ishmael. And the second event is today's passage, Abram's well at Beersheba. Abimelech, the king of Gerah, saw God was always with Abram. So he wanted to make a peace treaty with Abram, so that he won't find favor from God Abraham believed. But at the time, Abraham was in big trouble. Each time he dug a well and found the water, Abimelech's servant forcefully took away from him. It was a very arduous the task that took at least several months to find a place where water might be come out. In Genesis chapter 26, Abraham might have dug about three wells, but some scholars suggest he dug seven wells because Beersheba means seven wells. In any case, these wells were all taken away by the Ab Abimelech's servant. Abimelech swore to God that swore to Abraham it would never happen again. And then Abraham made a peace treaty with him. In addition, Abraham gave Abimelech seven ewes in addition to his sheep and oxen, demanded Abimelech the king himself be a witness to the well Abraham dug. And Abraham, Abimelech, took an oath. Later, Abraham named the place the Beersheba. In that place, Beersheba, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree and called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. On such occasions, Abraham used to build an altar and worship God. But in this text, it is unique. He planted a tamarisk tree and also he called on the name of the Lord, especially the everlasting God. What does this tree have to do with everlasting God? In the Mesopotamian the text, 
tamarisk tree appears as a tree purifying its surroundings. It is a sacred tree that was planted when a temple or royal palace was being built to purify and to remove uncleanness from its surroundings. It is also an evergreen tree that is extremely hardy and reproductive and even able to grow in dry and salty places like a desert. So it is a symbol of abundance and fecundity in the Arabic world even today. Wherever it was planted, it soon became a forest and providing shades and the resting places for many people. Abraham believed God would give this land to his future generation as a promise, and that he would make this land abundant. Therefore, Abraham's planting this tamarisk tree was an expression of his faith. Although he is now a stranger in this land, living as wandering nomad, one day the faithful God would keep his promise and give Abraham's descendant a pure and abundant nation. At the well of Beersheba, Abraham worshipped the God who transcended time, who transcended the death, who is almighty and live forever and ever. Amen? The whole series of events about the offspring and the land is all related to the well. In the ancient Near East, a wife who bears many children was metaphorically expressed as a deep well with abundant water. For Abraham, wells are the lifeblood of the land, enriching the land and to make the land habitable. Abraham was an outsider and a stranger in the land of Gera. No matter how many decades he lived in the land, he could not shake off the feeling of being an outsider. So he lived in solitude and insecurity, like a tiny candle in front of a blowing wind. As an outsider, if anyone tried to take his wife Sarah, his symbolic well, he had to let her be taken away. Even if he dug his own wells, he had to let them be taken away. As an outsider, Abraham was so powerless and helpless. But the everlasting God came to Abraham. Then he fulfilled his promise by guiding and protecting Abraham's wells. But that is not the end of it. After this sequence of the event, God came to test Abraham. This test seems to break down the faithfulness of the Almighty God. He needs descendant to keep his covenant with Abraham. But the sacrificing that descendant does not fulfill the covenant. It is never easy to have faith in something you do not understand. We see this in the story of the Job. For long 42 chapters, we see Job's desperate struggle to plead with God about the suffering he does not understand but we see Abraham's faith overcome it. Although Abraham was so, so afraid of his future and his life, so that he twice lied, Sarah was his sister, now believing in the everlasting God who came to his well and protect them and then fulfill his promise. Abraham now obeyed God's command with resurrection faith. 
In this way, Abraham demonstrated the accomplishment of faith from calling on the everlasting God to believing in Him. In the Bible, many people encountered this everlasting God at their wells. The woman at the well in John chapter 4 also everlasting encountered this God through the Jesus. Jesus' word filled her bleak, dark, and cursed past and a certain future. We also need to encounter this everlasting God who comes to the well of our lives and then feel him and then experience him. I have met many Korean and Chinese Americans. They came to America and with the hope of achieving something of themselves. Even though they lived here even for 20 years, 30 years, and 40 years, even having their children, grandchildren, I saw the many people are living with a feeling with unsettlement and anxiety in their daily lives. If you ever lived as a missionary outside of the America, you probably felt the same thing. Although you are living as a natives in America, basically our lives are like a nomad, without knowing where to go and what to do many times. As I prepared for this sermon, there was one person who came to my mind. She was called here the four-fingered pianist. Born with a congenital limb defection, she had only two fingers on each hand. And at the age of three, she had to have an amputation surgery below the knee. So she played the piano by paddling with her thigh bones. What touched most was this pianist mother, the Gapson. Gapson's husband was also the grade one spinal cord paralyzed after an accident during the military operation. After eight years of the marriage, Gapson conceived a baby, but ultrasound tests revealed that baby was deformed. Her husband, who well understood the suffering of the disabled, suggested her aborting the baby. But Gabson, while praying to God, decided to give a birth and then raise the baby. Soon after the baby was born, other family members came to see her, but ran away in fear. This mother alone sat by her daughter's side and prayed to God with tears and in her eyes. Lord, you made this word and said it was beautiful. So my baby must have come into the world for a reason. In the middle of her prayer, she heard God's comforting voice. Do not ignore her because of her different outlook. She quickly got up and then took out her baby's hand and then saw two fingered hands. She felt they looked like two beautiful tulip leaves. There is no doubt Gabson had to raise her daughter with a lot of tears and struggles. In the early 2000s, she was diagnosed with a cancer. But due to her body condition, she cannot take chemotherapy or anti-cancer drugs. So she does not know when her life will come to an end. But she said, I'm not afraid of dying because I know God has always given me and my daughter the best grace from the highest place. Can you believe what she said? This is irony. It is mystery. It is hard to believe, but we can see the desperate hope 
rise up toward God in the midst of excruciating the pain. This woman met God. Yes, she met God in her prayer. My beloved and brothers and sisters, we also have to encounter this everlasting God who comes to our well in our lives, in our chapel worship service, and in our prayers. I don't know the, what pain and suffering you are going through. I don't know the one you may face in the future. But I do know this for certain. There is a hope in our lives, even when we are like a candle light in front of a stick, storm. Because we have our God, the Lord, who is everlasting and faithful. We can shake off our fears about our future and move toward in faith. There must be something in our future we do not understand. We can face tomorrow because our faithful and the everlasting God lives forever and ever. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, please come to us and meet us. And so that, Lord, we can touch you, we can feel you, we can experience you. Lord, I don't know what kind of you know, pain and suffering we are going through in our future and in our present. But Lord, because you are live forever and ever, we have a hope, we have a joy, we have a certainty in our future. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, your the presence. Thank you, your you know the presence and the faithfulness. Thanks, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.